Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We're delighted to have you today. I'm going to turn it over to our CEO, JB Holston, to kick off the session. Thanks very much, Jenna. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we have a packed agenda and a packed group of per perfectly fabulous partners um, whom you're going to be hearing from shortly. So I'm going to keep my comments uh, briefly. My name is J.B. Holston. I'm the CEO of the Greater Washington Partnership. The partnership was formed in 2017, and it's supported by roughly 40 of the largest employers in the region from Baltimore to Richmond. And all of these employers share a common goal to ensure that this is the most inclusive growth economy in the country. Uh, and uh, our belief and the data supports it is that the most inclusive and equitable economy in the country will also be the fastest growing uh, economy. Uh, it will be the place that will both attract but also um, be the best, best home for talent that's raised uh, here. Um, as part of that mission, we've had a focus on skills and talent since the uh, creation of the partnership and uh, created the Capital CoLab, which many of you know, uh, as a way to catalyze to scale some critical solutions that we felt could fill gaps uh, in, in the region's skills and talent portfolio. Uh, and we've had great success around digital certificates with our uh, with many of our partners uh, who are joining us today, uh, and also with our talent ready uh, efforts with uh, K through 12, uh, as well as some scholarship uh, efforts. Uh, all of that, uh, that focus, uh, I think there are two critical things for this uh, discussion about that focus from the partnership. One is that the conversation between employers uh, and educators and uh, about workforce is um, more innovative, interesting, and fast changing than ever. Um, COVID has arguably brought the future of work to today uh, for all of us. Uh, and all of the employers in the region are acutely working to understand how they can um, do the best possible to provide career uh, 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 family supporting jobs for the broadest, most diverse uh, uh, sources of talent uh, across the region. Um, in, in concert with that, of course, we have a new federal administration uh, and we have a tremendous amount of funding, uh, some of which is expressed through the American Rescue Plan uh, that has uh, been generated to deal with the aftermath of, of COVID, uh, but all of which has a tremendous focus on workforce and workforce development and the future of work. Uh, so we're delighted to convene this conversation today with some some experts on that topic, but also most importantly, the people who are going to be on the front lines for determining um, how um, we create opportunity around this new funding uh, here across the region. So we thank everyone for participating. We thank our speakers for joining us as well. This is going to be uh, an exciting conversation. I'm glad we've recorded it because it'll be hard to remember everything you hear, um, uh, and it is uh, truly valuable. With that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, the organi organizer, our chef d'orchestre for today's events, uh, our Director of Workforce Initiatives, Robert Owens. Robert, to you. Thank you, JB. Welcome, everyone, to the American Rescue Plan Workforce Wars webinar. It's hosted by the Greater Washington Partnerships Capital Collab. As JB said, I'm Robert Owens, the Director for Workforce Initiative at the Capital Lab, and I'm joined today by an impressive group of panelists whom you will be meeting shortly. So we structured this webinar to take place in two sections. First, we'll give you a broader perspective so we are learning what's happening around the county and country and how the national trends are laying the groundwork for our regional and local efforts. Following that, we will focus on our immediate region efforts and hear from our workforce boards leaders from Maryland, Virginia, and DC. Now, because this agenda is so full, we encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A feature in our panelists uh, in our panel rather, uh, when not speaking, and the panelists will try to answer your questions uh, in that response. Now, throughout the presentation, you will notice QR codes on some of the slides. Now, these codes will lead you to more in-depth information that our panelists want you to know about during their presentations. To access the content, simply you just point your mobile devices camera to the code and a link should pop up at the top of your screen. So without that, without further ado, I wanna introduce you to our first two speakers who will focus on the national landscape and the opportunities that we're seeing in the form of the American Rescue Plan. So first of all, Brittany Daltrey, she is a senior project consultant with Thomas P. Millers and Associates. She has been with TPMA for several seven years and works with state workforce agencies and local workforce boards 
on strategic plans, one-stop operations, trainings, and program design and implementation. We also have Father her Steve Wojtek. He is a policy advisor for Foresight Law and Policy, as well as with the National Association of Workforce Boards. He will talk about Steve in his role will provide strategic policy support to a variety of public and private sector clients on a range of issues, including career technical education, CTE, workforce development, data assessments, and the federal budget and appropriations process. So to kick us off, I'd like to bring Brittany Daughtry to the stage to walk us through what is the American Rescue Plan blueprint. So Brittany, welcome, take it away. All right, thank you, Robert. Um, I'm pleased to be here and part of this round table. Um, as Robert mentioned, I'm with Thomas P. Miller & Associates. We're a national consulting firm that does work across the country, mostly in the areas of workforce development, education, economic, and um, community development. And so over the past year, we've really been working with um, clients on recovery projects and helping them navigate the influx of federal funding um, that's been released um, due to the pandemic. And so um, recently we put together um, a, a short blueprint or guide on the American Rescue Plan. And this was really just to help our clients um, and others in the public understand at a high level what the funding is, how it can be used, what are the reporting and um, time or timelines um, and just provide some a foundation for the plan. And so I'll quickly go through that today. Again, it's very high level. Um, we'll go through some examples of uses for um, local workforce boards and what we've seen and some considerations for you, um, but certainly use that QR code to um, access the blueprint for additional information. So next slide, please. Okay, so quick, quick um, overview, 350 billion, yes, billion with a B, um, funding available for state, local, um, territorial, and tribal, tribal governments. Um, and really the, the focus of this funding is to support COVID response efforts, replace lost public sector revenue, support economic stabilization, and address public health and economic challenges. Um, so of that 350 billion, um, nearly 200 billion available for states and the uh, DC area, 65.1 billion for counties, 45.6 billion for metropolitan cities, and then um, additional funds for the territories and tribal governments. And these are kind of the funding objectives, which you can, you can read through on this slide. Um, the next slide, please. Okay, so just kind of what the areas of focus are. Support public health response. Um, basically, that's some examples of that are contact tracing, PPE acquisition, vaccine education, um, similar things like that to just help with COVID-19 um, mitigation efforts. Supporting or replacing public sector revenue loss. So using funds to provide government, serv government services, um, in support um, that funding or revenue. And then investments in infrastructure around water, sewer, broadband. Um, certainly the pandemic brought to light the, the challenges rural areas and um, even urban areas face with um, internet and broadband access. So funding to support those investments, investments in those areas, uh, premium pay for essential workers, um, prioritizing low moderate income workers who perform essential workers essential work. So thinking about those in healthcare, grocery, food service, education, childcare, transit, um, and providing kind of pay to um, provide additional support to those essential workers. And then probably the one that's most relevant to all of us on the phone and, and the workforce boards is addressing negative economic impacts. Um, so responding to economic harms to workers, families, business, impacted industries, and the public sector. And that's what we'll really kind of focus on here this morning. Next slide, please. Okay, so what, what does that look like? And what are some examples um, of uses of funds to address negative economic impacts and provide equity-focused services? Assistance to unemployed workers, um, food, housing, cash, other assistance uh, to those in need, rehiring staff and, and replenish, replenishing state unemployment insurance funds, 
um, assistance for job training. I'm assuming that's probably what most of you are, are focused on is that assistance for job training, small business support, um, which could be loans, grants, or technical assistance. Um, so, you know, thinking about your business services teams and how they can provide um, small business support, um, addressing health disparities, um, supporting impacted industry. So, you know, we've seen the, the negative impact um, that has been, that has occurred on tourism, travel, hospitality, um, sectors like that. So grants, technical assistance, supports for those industries, um, and then kind of addressing the disparities and providing equity focus, um, thinking about additional supports to populations that you're, you're probably already serving working with partner organizations to focus on access to services, primarily in the areas of education, childcare, and housing. Okay, next slide. And I warned you, I'm going through this really quickly. Um, so, you know, we, we have this QR code available here for you. Um, but this is really what I would, I would like our focus to be on here this morning um, and what I wanna highlight. So I think it's important to understand timeline and reporting requirements. Um, we have that available, um, the, the current um, deadlines and timelines available in our blueprints, um, but continue to watch for this. Um, the final rule has not been released. Um, there was a public comment period, and my understanding is they're reviewing the public comments and then um, are working to finalize the final rule. So keep an eye out for that final rule. Um, the other thing is to really try to understand what your local processes are for how do you, how do you access the funding, who has the funding, um, what's the process. So, you know, as I mentioned, their funding is going at the state level, city, county level. So for you all on the, on the webinar, it probably means um, reaching out to your state workforce agency to understand what they're doing with funding. Um, some states are, are kind of keeping it and using it to support um, statewide initiatives or priorities. Others are releasing it or allocating it to local workforce boards. So find out what your state is doing through your state workforce agency and then find out what's happening locally. So I would say, you know, as a workforce board, that would be reaching out to your chief elected official or local elected, elected official. Um, there may be a process uh, through city county councils or uh, mayor's offices. So really just understand where the money is and how um, you can access it and what that process looks like. Uh, the next thing I would say is to um, connect with your partner. So um, you probably all have heard about, you know, don't operate in silos. It's important not to be in silos and, and to collaborate and coordinate your activities. And I would say it's especially important when you have this um, federal funding. So thinking about um, your education partners and those that are receiving Department of Education funds, are there ways to partner with your community colleges or um, other higher education institutions or training providers? Um, how do you partner with economic development? Um, so we know that the Economic Development Ad Administration or EDA has the Build Back Better Regional Challenge and Good Jobs Challenge. And we've heard of local workforce boards um, applying for these grants. So you know, certainly look into those grants, reach out to your local economic development partners, understand what their strategic plans are and their priorities. Um, and then also think about your health and human services or social service agencies and figuring out what they're doing, what their needs are, um, how they may be accessing uh, this funding as well. Um, the other thing is, is timing. So, you know, in 2020, there was the CARES Act funding, which had a, a very quick turnaround period. Um, the funding was released and it needed to be expended very quickly. Um, we have a little more time with this funding, so funds have to be obligated by December 31st, 2024, um, and then the, the work needs to be completed and funds spent by 1231, 2026. So we have a couple of years for this funding. You need to move quickly, um, but, not, but you need to be smart about what you're doing and how you're um, utilizing this funding. So again, understand your local processes and deadlines, um, and then be thoughtful and considerate about 
you know, your strategy. Um, this funding is less restrictive than some of the funding you're, you're used to. If, if you're mostly relying on Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act funding, um, this has a little more flexibility with it. So you can do some of the things you maybe weren't able to do in the past. Um, so think about what are the things that we've wanted to do but haven't been able to do or what needs have been brought to light by the pandemic and how can we be thoughtful about how we prevent those issues going forward? You know, what are our future needs? So um, be intentional and strategic. If you have a strategic plan, bring it out, look at it and um, consider this funding um, in light of what your strategies are. So again, thinking longer term, bigger picture, future needs of your community. Um, so be intentional and strategic with your use of funding. Um, so I'll turn it over to Robert. I'll be available on the chat if you have questions and use the QR code um, to access, for, access the blueprint. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brittany. Now that we have the foundation of the blueprint and how state and local governments are using the ARPA funds, we'll hear from Steve Wojtek, who will provide a national perspective on how workforce boards are utilizing these funds. I'll toss it over to you, Steve. Thanks, Robert. And as you mentioned on the top, I'm a policy advisor working with the National Association of Workforce Boards, or NAWB, or NOB. Uh, NOB is the national membership association representing the nation's over 550 business-led workforce development boards found throughout the country. Uh, while I'm sure many of you tuning in today already know what a workforce board is, uh, for those that don't, they are the primary entity overseeing and administering uh, federal funding from the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA. Uh, boards serve many different functions in their states, regions, and local areas, bringing together a variety of stakeholders to provide a host of career and training services uh, to employers, job seekers. Uh, today, I'm here to talk to you all about uh, what we've been seeing recently at the national level uh, with regards to how states and workforce boards are making use of American Rescue Plan funds. Uh, equally as instructive, I also wanted to touch briefly on how boards have already been leveraging uh, resources from earlier pandemic aid packages, uh, a package funding rather, to help workers and individuals obtain the skills and credentials they need for future success. Uh, so as Brittany uh, spoke about just a bit ago, the ARP funds that have been made available to state, local, municipal, and county governments uh, are rather flexible. Uh, while workforce boards are not made an explicit or direct recipient of these dollars, uh, their composition, inclusive of public officials often at these levels of government, uh, oftentimes ensures boards have a seat at the proverbial table. Uh, moreover, uh, most of the activities that I'll talk about in just a bit fall under that addressing negative economic impacts use of funds that Brittany touched on a bit ago. Uh, significantly, ARPA funds have a much longer timeline for implementation, so a much longer sort of runway. Uh, all funds must be obligated by the end of 2024 and spent down by 2026. Uh, as a result, many states, local areas, uh, regions are right now in the, the initial stages of determining how best to deploy these resources uh, for workforce development via the systems that they oversee. So significantly, um, and because of this, rather, sorry, uh, many of the best examples we've seen this year using pandemic aid dollars for these purposes has come from the CARES Act and the tranche of funding uh, that Congress authorized last December. By and large, we anticipate many of the same efforts that were initially started or funded uh, using these dollars uh, to be deepened and expanded upon in the coming months and years ahead. Uh, so what are some of the common uh, themes and trends that we've been seeing through this work? A few things. First, we've seen a number of initiatives focused on short-term credentialing uh, and certification efforts. Uh, one of the most prominent examples of this uh, recently has been in Florida with the rapid credentialing effort. Uh, the purpose of this program aims to connect unemployed, underemployed, furloughed workers uh, with training and in in-demand area of the regional workforce board. These training experiences must culminate in a credential of value uh, within one of these in-demand fields. In many cases, boards have been partnering with local community colleges in Florida and post-secondary career and technical education centers to recruit and, uh, and enroll rather uh, eligible individuals for these opportunities. So in addition to helping individuals earn new credentials, uh, we've also seen instances where these dollars 
have been used to fund completion or attainment grants. Uh, these are most typically targeted at individuals who have stopped out of education or training previously uh, without earning a degree or credential. Uh, by identifying these individuals and re-enrolling them, especially at a time when they are likely unemployed or underemployed due to the pandemic, uh, more individuals can wrap up the remainder of their training or education uh, and come out on the other side of the ongoing pandemic with a credential of value. Uh, we've seen this in action in Pennsylvania recently with their near completer demonstration project uh, that has so far uh, awarded up, I think over $8 million for these purposes. Uh, we've also seen a, a similar example in our own region, uh, close by in Maryland with the One Step Away grant program, although workforce boards have not played as a significant role in those efforts. Uh, the ARP also contains specific targeted funds for selected industries, uh, as Brittany mentioned too. Uh, particularly for sectors like public health. While we won't delve into the specifics of those funding streams on this webinar, uh, we have been seeing a new focus on targeting ARP funds uh, to, to these kinds of selected industries. Uh, this work largely breaks down into two main categories. Uh, first, efforts to reskill or upskill workers in industries hit hardest by the pandemic. So think uh, sectors like restaurants, retail, entertainment, uh, like the other broad category relates to beefing up workforce development support for critical industries such as healthcare or other high growth and in-demand economic sectors with robust you know, growth prospects for the coming years. Uh, so in Virginia, for example, the REV initiative, or short for Reemploy Virginians, is aimed at helping individuals cover the cost of tuition and fees in in-demand fields that will lead to careers in their state. Individuals that are unemployed or underemployed due to the COVID-19 pandemic can receive up to $3,000 for short-term training or certification programs at eligible training providers, most often community colleges, uh, found throughout the state. Uh, the Forward Delaware program is another example of these, uh, these types of efforts. Uh, Forward Delaware is a training uh, initiative in the state that has helped at least 1,200 individuals uh, who were laid off from industries most impacted by the pandemic, uh, retrain, reskill, uh, to find new employment in fields like information technology, uh, healthcare, uh, and transportation. While this work began with funding from the CARES Act, uh, the state hopes to expand and extend this effort with ARP funding in the coming months. Um, so again, something that we've seen kind of recurring throughout uh, states is really kind of beginning with some of the stuff that was started last year and really uh, with the significant new funds that are coming from ARP Kind of deepening and expanding them in the years to come. So finally, we've also seen states begin to use ARP and other pandemic aid dollars to expand apprenticeship efforts. Uh, in the past year alone, we've seen Iowa use more than $5 million to expand uh, on existing or create new uh, registered apprenticeship programs in their state. Uh, we've also seen a $3 million program known as GAINS or Growing Apprenticeship in Non-Traditional Sectors uh, in New Jersey. And there's also a comparable effort underway being spearheaded by the State Workforce Board in Rhode Island, uh, which is also focused on expanding registered apprenticeship programs into these non-traditional fields. So typically the, the fields that don't have registered apprenticeships traditionally think IT, healthcare, things like that. But more recently, we've seen proposals emanating from Connecticut, uh, totaling nearly $100 million for similar purposes. Uh, both to expand apprenticeship opportunities uh, and to integrate these uh, experiences further within systems of educational workforce development, which I think is going to be another thing that we see uh, in the months and years ahead. Uh, so with that, I know we covered a lot of ground. I want to stop there. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today and looking forward to the rest of the webinar. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. Now we're going to narrow the scope down to the capital region to focus on specific initiatives and programs occurring within the greater capital region relating to the ARP funds. So we have a panelist of four individuals. We have Michael DiGiacomo, excuse me, executive director for the Governor Workforce Investment Board in Maryland. We have Jason Perkins Coins, executive director with the Baltimore Mayor's Office of Employment Development. Anna Smith, Executive Director for DC Workforce Investment Council, and Jane Dittmar, Deputy Chief Workforce Advisor at the Office of the Governor, Commonwealth of Virginia. 
I've invited each of them to speak five minutes about effective uh, efforts underway in their jurisdictions and how then we can engage in the dialogue about the capital region. So I'm going to kick it off to Mike. I'm asking everyone to turn the cameras on. Uh, Mike, can you give us some examples of how local workforce boards are using the ARPA funds in the state of Maryland? Hey, thanks, Robert. Um, as Robert said, Mike DiGiacomo, Executive Director for the Governor's Workforce Development Board uh, in Maryland. At the, state, uh, at the state level, Maryland dedicated $75 million over two years directly to the 13 local workforce development boards. And because the ARPA funds are less prescriptive than WIOA, they're being used in a variety of creative ways. Some of the local workforce boards are using the funds to outreach to job seekers who are not familiar with the American Job Centers to come and learn about the training and apprenticeship opportunities that are available. Some are working with partners uh, on mental health initiatives to get people back into the workforce. Others are working on transportation initiatives to assist job seekers in getting back to work. One local area purchased a mobile job center to actually meet people where they are and get them connected to those services. And to learn more about what a specific local area is doing, I'm gonna flip it back to Robert. Thank you, Robert. All right, thank you, Mike. And Mike, we wanna now shift it and flip it like you were saying to Jason to provide that perspective from the local board. So Jason Perkins Coins, again, uh, with the Zen Director for the Mayor's Office of Public Development. Jason, can you really talk about what's happening in the city of Baltimore? Sure can. Uh, thanks, Robert. Thanks, Mike uh, and the others. Uh, welcome to Baltimore folks virtually. Uh, I, I, we have six strategies and I got five minutes. So I'm gonna be zipping right through these, but would love to take your questions and follow up uh, at a later time or, or during this session. So uh, just jumping right in, you know, you heard the presentations about COVID. What's the first thing we gotta do? We gotta get people to work. So if you look at our little graphic here and maybe 10 o'clock on the dial, you see higher up. You think about the greatest workforce program of all time. I think most of us would say it would be FDR's New Deal, right? And it was transitional work opportunities to put people to work in public good concepts, building roads, bridges, and dams. Well, it's 2021. In Baltimore, we're using that concept to put people to work to make our city cleaner, greener, and more welcoming. So all of these jobs pay $15 an hour. They're meant to be rapid attachment to get into them quickly. They're, work, they're, they're working right now uh, with our Baltimore Health Corps as one of our initiatives that had 300 residents go to work as contact tracers and community health workers. They're with our Department of Public Works. They're with our Rec and Parks. They're with our downtown partnership. Get folks to work quickly, at least $15 an hour. A job is beautiful. We know it's not enough. You heard the presentations about skilling up. So we have an initiative called Train Up. Higher Up was getting to work quickly. Train Up is to build those skills. At six o'clock on the dial, we actually have an RFP out right now and it closes on Friday at four o'clock. You can see that at baltoworkforce.com. I'll put that in the chat later. Uh, but the idea is we're investing about $7 million into occupational skills training. I should have mentioned both higher up and train up uh, come with separate grants that provide behavioral health services and legal assistance services to every resident that participates in those programs. Uh, train up will put uh, training opportunities available to 1200 residents. We'll have separate grants as part of train up that will come out to provide literacy enhancement. We know that many of our residents don't have the literacy skills to either get into training or a job. So we're gonna address that as a workforce agency. And we also have something called community connectors that helps residents attach to these different strategies. So, um, so getting folks to work and training them. We have a separate program at 12 o'clock on the dial or 11 o'clock called Grads to Careers, which focuses on young adults who are exiting high school with a high school diploma, but aren't going to college, aren't sure what their career is gonna look like. We know that is a transition point where all of the data is negative if they become disengaged. So we're gonna expand something we're already doing with, that brings occupational training into the senior year of high school and helps them transition right on out uh, into a job. Uh, beyond the training programs, again, you heard the presentation from Steve, this fits right within it. We're working with our state and with Mike around expanding apprenticeships. We wanna 
expand those apprenticeships that are going. We want to start ones that aren't going that could be going because we have an engaged employer community. And we want to wake up those apprenticeship programs that have been dormant for a while for different reasons. So we're investing with our state right into apprenticeship. Uh, in addition, we want to work with our small business community. And so what we're doing is we are focusing our attention on small minority and uh, women owned businesses. This is more or less one o'clock on the dial. Uh, these are businesses that have been hardest hit by the pandemic and we're offering to subsidize the wages for the, up to $6,000 for those employers who meet that criteria and are hiring Baltimore city residents who have been impacted by COVID. It's not a strategy we've ever done uh, on our own and we're partnering with our Baltimore Development Corporation, which is essentially our local uh, economic development arm. Uh, and I think hopefully one theme you hear throughout of these is partnership, right? So train up is gonna have 10 grants, community connectors will have four, literacy will have at least two, higher up with a lot of different city agencies, et cetera. Uh, and then finally, uh, well, I'm quite, not quite finally, one of the other things in terms of supports, I've talked about legal services and behavioral health services that will be available. Baltimore is really challenged from a transportation perspective. It comes up when you talk to employers who can't find their workforce. It comes up when you talk to residents who can't get to the jobs or the training programs. We just don't have the, uh, the, the transportation system that we would like to have. And we gotta, we gotta do something about it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna be partnering with ride share programs like Lyft, Uber, et cetera, and just paying for a resident's transportation to and from work uh, within city limits, any city resident to one of those, uh, to any business within the city who are participants in these strategies for the first month uh, while they're on the job. The idea is that by that time, they likely have a paycheck uh, and, uh, and therefore hopefully can, uh, can meet some of their needs. We're also partnering with a local nonprofit who helps provide uh, low cost vehicles uh, in the right circumstances. And then finally, uh, none of this will matter if we're not uh, providing more access to services and reaching out to communities who uh, have, been, have been disinvested in. Uh, so we've got a couple of strategies there. One is most likely at some point today, if not tomorrow, we'll be announcing something we're calling community job hubs. And what those are, those are strategies in which you know, Mike referenced sort of meeting people where they are. So we've got uh, thanks, Molly, for the chat. Uh, we've got uh, nonprofit partners in all parts of our city, um, and we're willing to partner with them where we're actually going to be sending uh, one of our staff people, a workforce development professional, who will, on our payroll, work out of that organization uh, you know, five days a week. Um, and we, we piloted that strategy already. They've served 8,000 residents, many of whom would have a really hard time accessing our services otherwise. Uh, and we're going to be having five new job hubs started to reach parts of our city that, again, have a harder time reach, uh, harder time connecting to us and populations that are more disconnected as well. And then the last strategy uh, I would mention is uh, connected to the job hubs really is around having mobile staff. So Mike talked about having a mobile unit in one jurisdiction, and that's great. Uh, we've had that as well. We're going to have staff who are just in regular cars, but they're going to be hitting, again, different communities that otherwise have a harder time reaching our services. We want to make sure that they know about all of these strategies and everything else that's going on in the city to make sure that we're providing an inclusive opportunity for residents and businesses who've been hardest hit by the pandemic. So I will stop there, Robert. Hopefully I stayed more or less within time, but again, more than happy to take questions on the back end. No problem. Thank you so much, Jason. That's really interesting to hear. I especially appreciate how you're focusing on getting people to work and paying a sustainable wage as well as with the transportation policy. I know that's one of the many barriers that residents uh, across the capital region face. So that is great to hear. I want to turn it over now to Jane and ask Jane some of the similar questions. Jane, how is Virginia approaching the use of these funds and what large systematic challenges are you tackling because of these funds that you have? Jane? Thanks, Robert, and thanks to the Greater Washington Partnership. This is a, a privilege to be with these panelists today. Uh, would you go to my first slide, please? Uh, I uh, would like to just go over uh, uh, some things that are particular to our state, to the Commonwealth about our workforce system. If you look there at the map of our state, you will see many uh, counties and some dots, white dots that represent incorporated cities. 
we have divided ourselves into 14 workforce development areas. Six are mainly rural and eight are suburban and metropolitan, including the, the areas around the greater Washington area. Next slide, please. Uh, we do uh, in-person uh, service delivery now that we're emerging from the pandemic. We um, are also doing, uh, uh, we're using a lot of technology for Zoom appointments and virtual job fairs. Um, we, uh, next slide, please. We, um, and you did get an overview uh, uh, previously about workforce boards. We're very proud of ours. Any state or territory that receives federal dollars must have a workforce board appointed by the governor. It must have a robust number of business seats and we have complied with that. We have 41 members total on our board, which is a large board, but very active. 20% come from organized labor and training providers. Again, that's from federal statute. And potentially unique to our board, our governor has appointed six of his cabinet secretaries and the General Assembly has appointed four elected. Uh, and we add to that two local government leaders for their uh, perspective. Uh, finally, we have no paid staff for the workforce board. Every agency that receives either federal dollars or state dollars must have a um, deputy level or above uh, uh, a candidate for us to choose from to serve as staff so that we have content experts serving the board. Next slide, please. Uh, after the CARES Act and Families First Act, we had our act together as far as figuring out how to drill down on the requirements of these large uh, federal relief programs. And uh, so the proclamation for the governor charged the General Assembly to come back into session, a special session in August. And then we began our preparations uh, and recommendations for the General Assembly here in the governor's office. Our workforce board decided not to dilute their message to the governor and asked for um, our funds to be focused on technology improvements, especially broadband and to the work, uh, local workforce network. Next slide, please. So uh, here in Virginia, uh, we received a total of $7.2 billion. Uh, 4.3 went to the state for appropriations through the General Assembly. We have uh, uh, allocated now all but 700 million. Our General Assembly in 2022, which convenes in January, will allocate the rest. 2.9 billion went directly to our localities. And we also used the full extension of our unemployment benefits as did about 24 other states. And I think the District of Columbia. Next slide, please. We've already gone through the buckets that are state priorities and during the question and answer period, if you want to know more about how we and our task force and the task forces we uh, convened around those buckets uh, determined their allocations, I'm happy to do that. Next bucket, please. Our local government partners also looked at their buckets and I think we had a good explanation of that previously. Next slide, please. And we put this together to show you the local partners and what their allocations were from our funds directly in the Washington region. Uh, it is over 600 million. And that does not include, as I've said, the state funds that we're spending in the region. These, uh, these jurisdictions were chosen to show you because we looked at their commu compute, commuter patterns, both our workforce going to jobs somewhere in the Washington region and your workforce coming to our businesses in these counties. Um, uh, before I close, I'd like to tell you that we uh, value greatly the um, recognition we received just pre-pandemic of being the best state in the country to do business. We just received it again this year. We know that it's a yin-yang relationship, our business owners and their capital and our skilled workforce. So, we keep that in mind with all of our policy decisions. I will um, turn it back over to Robert and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jane. We're now going to shift gears to focus on DC. Anna, from your seat at the head of DC WIC, can you tell us about how DC is distributing its funds? Sure, thank you, Robert. And, and thank you to the Greater Washington Partnership for organizing this great 
conversation and it's wonderful to hear from my colleagues about the work happening uh, in our neighboring jurisdictions. We can go ahead to the next slide, please. Uh, so for those who are maybe not familiar, DC Workforce Investment Council serves as both the state and local board. So uh, appropriate that we are, we are closing up the show here, um, but the DC WIC uh, serves as the connector coordinator in support of um, all of our workforce efforts uh, alongside um, a handful of district government agencies, uh, our employers and community-based organizations. And um, we're very fortunate that Mayor Bowser in our uh, fiscal year 22 budget um, really uh, chose to invest our ARP funds um, to build a more equitable DC. So unlike most other jurisdictions and states, DC didn't get all of the CARES Act funding, um, particularly for workforce that um, uh, others did. And so we are um, ramping up, uh, learning from lessons uh, across the past year uh, and excited to make um, some significant investments to support uh, ensuring that our employers have the skilled pipelines of talent they need and that our residents have access to the education and training and skills um, needed to be competitive in today's labor market. Um, so on this slide, you'll see a little bit of grounding. I wanted to contextualize um, what I'll speak a little bit more to, um, but uh, across our ARP funds, um, we are investing in everything from housing to early learning and childcare to uh, re-envisioning what high school looks like with extended uh, school year internships uh, and career technical education opportunities, developing a technical center um, for folks to learn hands-on. Um, and then for our businesses, which uh, my colleagues and the deputy mayor for planning e economic development oversee, um, we are setting up um, grants and fund opportunities to support businesses, particularly in our urban core, um, to ensure that we are um, attracting and keeping and helping grow our businesses, because we know that they are critical to continued economic development in DC. So I would encourage you for our employers out there to check out obviouslydc.com for those opportunities for employers. Um, but what I'll talk a little bit more about in the remaining time I have is about um, uh, where we in the workforce system are really leaning in, which is this first bubble of driving inclusive job, jobs recovery for residents. So these objectives at the top that you'll see uh, uh, encompass and include about almost $300 million in ARPA funding uh, this year to support job seeker and employer connections. So the workforce board in partnership with uh, all of our American Job Center colleagues and, um, uh, and nonprofit organizations will be supporting the development of a career coaching core. Uh, this has been done in other jurisdictions. We, we know that many residents need to um, have support even to understand what might be the best um, career opportunity for them to connect into or move along in their careers. Um, what education, training, job readiness, um, opportunities that exist already are best for them. And so we will be deploying uh, up to 50 career coaches for the next couple of years to support those folks. We're going to be doing a, a surge in high impact credentialing. And so the WIC will be releasing some uh, grants to expand training, particularly in healthcare and, and uh, IT occupations. Um, there will be more expansion of some of our credentialing that happens um, through our partners at the Department of Employment Services. Um, uh, and in particular, we're really excited about looking at paid opportunities to learn at work. And so some of the credentialing opportunities that we will be providing um, will include uh, money to, for stipends and or um, on the job training experiences. Uh, our DC Infrastructure Academy will be expanding opportunities and seats there as well because we know that folks need to get to work uh, and also invest in their themselves and their educational attainment. We're also uh, prioritizing employer driven training. And so what that's going to look like from the workforce board is releasing grants to support and encourage partnerships between employers and training organizations. We know that uh, in, when employers have a say and have skin in the game and are informing um, the skills and training that they need, um, that there is even greater uh, investment and likelihood of folks participating and receiving those credentials and landing a job at the end of the uh, training opportunity. We also know that employers are seeking to upskill their, their current workforce um, to ensure that they're able to fill um, uh, vacancies uh, for which we might not have the pipelines uh, that they require at the moment. And so we'll be making grants specifically to support those partnerships and encourage employers seeking to work with higher education institutions, community college, uh, or uh, community training organizations to develop those pipelines. Um, and then the last couple of things we'll talk about are 
um, really reimagining how we are connecting and investing in our talent pipeline um, as early as you know middle school. And so um, we are supporting some funding for um, free college attainment for some of our young people. Uh, like I said before, internships, um, expansion of opportunities um, for folks to uh, understand and learn about um, careers that they may be interested in. And so another place I think we're really excited to bring partnership and employers to the table. So I will leave it at that, Robert, uh, and look forward to answering other questions and speaking more about some of the work DC is investing in uh, when we get to the question and answers. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you, everyone. So now that we have a top level summary of what we are doing, I want to shift quickly to a roundtable style Q&A. Now, I want to be mindful we do have about 10 minutes, but I also want to make sure that those who are participating, if you have questions, to please drop it in the Q&A sections. So I'm going to ask all of the panels from Mike, Jason, Anna, uh, and Jane to turn your cameras on. Uh, since we have about like 10 minutes, I want to just throw this question out there and see if you can provide just a quick snippet uh, response. As JB said, we're really leaning heavily on equity here and diversity here at the partnership. My question is for each of you is, how are you all taking account to assure equity, uh, that you assure how we use equity with these funds to make sure that equity is a main focal point? So I wanna talk with you first, Mike, if you can provide a quick synopsis of how Maryland is making sure that equity is being the forefront with these funds. Well, a, a couple ways. So in addition, we talked about before, one is all about broadband, right? It's an investment in broadband technology so that all Marylanders can get connected and pursue jobs. Um, so that, that's one big piece. Uh, the other big piece is meeting people where they are. Um, so we've done a lot of work, uh, as Jason talked about, throughout Maryland to be able to get those services and training available to folks in the underserved communities, get them connected, doing outreach, bringing them into the American job centers. So for folks that you know might not necessarily uh, have used those services before, being able to get them connected. All right. Thank you. Um, Jason, I have a separate question for you, but I wanna ask Jane right quick, how is Virginia, the common really focusing on equity as well? And then uh, Anna, I will toss it to you to expound on that as well. Thanks Robert. That is an important question to ask and an even more important question to answer. Um, we know that our uh, communities of color uh, and overall low wage workers were the hardest hit. Uh, one of those buckets for ARPA funds was small business, both for the state level and local. And we have a third of that committed to uh, minority owned businesses. Uh, we here in the Commonwealth have a cabinet level diversity, equity and inclusion officer. I think it's the first in the country to be on the cabinet. Everything that we do, the policies that we have, we have to answer that question. So uh, all of our work, each of our buckets, we've looked at how we can make sure that our communities that have been uh, less represented in the past are better represented in policy going forward. All right, thank you, John. Jane, sorry, uh, Anna? Sure, uh, I think um, some of what Mike and Jane shared are, are similar strategies that DC is taking. I'll just sort of zone in on um, digital equity uh, as we think about for those folks most impacted and those um, seeking to access training and resources. We know that access to technology, broadband, um, and even the skills to be able to engage um, are gonna be critical. And so um, I'll, I'll give a shout out to the Tech Together initiative led by my colleagues at the Chief Technology Officers um, Agency. Uh, and we are working with private sector partners, public sector partners, uh, and across government um, to make sure that we're providing training and resources for folks to even be able to access some of these resources. So I think that's gonna be a critical investment that we are um, excited to be making. All right, thank you. Now, Jason, someone has a question directly to you, but I wanna make sure that I give you the opportunity to talk more uh, about equity uh, in the city of Baltimore. So I'll have you answer that question. Then I will ask the question that uh, one of the individuals wanted to find out from you. Sure, so uh, just briefly, um, equity should be part of all of our strategies. You know, our higher up strategy is about getting people to work who've been most impacted and we're targeting residents who are returning citizens, opportunity youth and adults who are on public assistance. And it's very intentional about getting them to work quickly, but also not leaving them. And again, combining these other strategies that I described. Also, again, to the point that other folks made around community job hubs, focusing on small minority and women owned businesses, 
these are all done with a vision of uh, equity. All right, Jason, thank you so much. Somebody asked a question, does it stay with you, Jason? Uh, Aaron Bebo wanted to know if you could share more on the transportation investment, especially the Uber Lyft partnership and the access to vehicles for eligible participants. Would you be able to expound upon it more? Sure, a little bit more. I mean, it hasn't started yet, but basically participants who are either in our higher up or train up strategy or who we're uh, aware of that we're putting to work through our uh, job centers are eligible for this strategy, we will first verify that they don't have a car themselves. Uh, and then uh, again, through these partnerships, we're able to, with a case manager, just able to look, determine what the rate would be. They, it will be seamless to the residents so that the, the rideshare will come to their home, take them to the place of employment. It'll be paid for with our dollars as, as an agreement with these uh, organizations. All right, thank you, Jason. I wanna come back to you, Jane, right quick. Uh, can you let us know about you know, how are you going to ensure that these programs are sustainable? You know, what's your measure of sustainability? So it's an interesting uh, question about sustainability. Uh, first, I'll say we were, have been very careful to, in, to choose and select appropriations that do not require continuing, continuing funding. Uh, we know that after we allocate by 2024, expend by 2026, that if we are funding things that require continuous funding and our General Assembly can't come up with continued funding, that that will be a crisis in some of those operations. Um, what we're doing, and it's been mentioned by all the other panelists, is we put 500 million of our 4.3 into broadband. We will connect every Virginian with accessible, affordable broadband by 2027. Uh, so the next governor who will serve four years will finish with a completely connected Commonwealth. That's a very sustain sustainable effort because that's investment that stays. Uh, that's just one example I would give. All right, thank you, Jane. I wanna to come to you, Mike. Somebody asked this question and I wanna see if you can answer Mike. Uh, when he talks about the sustainability, specifically how will WIC partnering uh, in different workforce boards are partnering with you know, city and private development procurement agencies to increase the use of contractors who already have demonstrated a for, for, for prioritization excuse me, of employer-driven training. Uh, how is the state of Maryland dealing with that when it comes to ensuring that we are, they're partnering with procurement agencies to increase the use of contractors who are already in the system? No, that, that, that's a great question, right? And it comes down to collaboration. And we do it with collaboration at the local level. So we direct all folks, nonprofits, anybody who's in, in the procurement world, to get in touch with the local area directors to understand how they are using those funds um, across the board. Not only, you know, we, we talk about folks in underserved communities, let's not leave out the pipelines of folks that are with special needs, right? There's, we need to be building pipelines and there's lots of opportunity for folks to get engaged at that level. Uh, so for anybody who is on the procurement side or, or in the nonprofit world that is already um, working um, in those areas to get in touch with your local area director uh, in Maryland to see how you can be part of their initiatives. All right, sounds good. I know we have about five minutes. The last question I want to throw to you, Anna, uh, DC being the mecca for like, you know, tourism, you know, aside from travel, leisure, hospitality, what sectors do you know experience the greatest impact from the pandemic? And what are you doing for people who work in those particular fields? Sure. So uh, I think the, the nail has been hit on the head. About 14% of DC's workforce prior to the pandemic was in hospitality and tourism. And we also project that that um, industry will recover most slowly. Um, and so uh, I, I think we are seeing it certainly the challenge in our you know, restaurants and um, uh, affiliated organizations as well. And I'll actually just say, I'm gonna sort of take an easy way out of this. We are hearing from our employers that everyone is struggling to find the talent that they need in every single industry, right? This great um, resignation period and this um, you know, 18 months of folks working remotely, rethinking their careers, their industry, what they want to be doing with their time, I think has impacted everyone across the board. And so um, we, we had a series of roundtables with employers in partnership with some of our, um, our chamber and federal city, city council. And I think it is something that we are seeing across the board um, that we are, we are thinking really critically about how to support 
um, the attractiveness of all of these industries. Uh, so not really answering your question directly, hospitality and tourism is where we saw the biggest challenge. Um, and we're really thinking about how to invest in, um, in all of our businesses in DC. All right, with that, I want to thank you all. Thank again, Mike, Jason, Anna, Jane, Brittany, Steve for providing insight in the programs and strategies from the, the national, state, and local government. I want to thank everyone for attending this roundtable. Again, the purpose of this really was to show how Capital Collab is convening individuals from the state and local level and how we are leaning heavily in on providing these opportunities uh, and awareness to our stakeholders. Uh, we do have some questions that we will be able to send out to some of the panelists to address after the particular session. I do want to tease out, we do have another webinar that's coming up. Now, this is a convening for secondary and post-secondary institutions. As you know, the schools have been impacted because of COVID-19. The American Rescue Plan will provide $40 billion to secondary and post-secondary institutions. Now this event, please feel free to you know, register using your phone for your QR code or even the link that we dropped in the chat. But this event will display or discuss the best practices for secondary and post-secondary institutions to leverage these funds to support learners. The audience will hear with with from education institutions in the capital regions and what they have planned to utilize these funds. So with that, I would like to thank a special shout out. Thank you to Destiny Mitchell for supporting putting this together along with Ramir and the Capital Collab team. Thank you everyone. If you would like to follow us, we do have social media, greaterwashingtonpartnership.com. We also have a newsletter that we will allow to include you on. So feel free to drop your email address in the chat and we'll be sure to include you on uh, different events, engagements and webinars that we have. With that, thank you so much for this opportunity to work with you all, to speak with you all. We hope that you enjoyed and learned a lot from this presentation. With that, take care, have a good day.